Hi everyone, today my guest is from Australia. Uh, my guest is James Berry, he's a research fellow at the Alfred Deakin Institute at uh, uh, Deakin University in Australia. Dr. Berry is a political anthropologist specializing in religious and ethnic minorities in the Middle East with a specific focus on Iran and nationalism. Uh, Dr. Berry has an extensive field experience and he is the author of the Armenian Christians in Iran published by Cambridge University Press in 2019. He has published his studies in ethnic and racial studies, Third World Quarterly, the British Journal of Middle Eastern Studies and Ir Iranian Studies. Dr. Berry uh, was the host and producer of the Iranian elections 1400 sponsored by the Middle Eastern Studies Forum at Alfred Deakin Institute. Uh, Dr. Bey speaks Arabic, Armenian, and Persian. Today, uh, we're going to talk about his uh, book called uh, Armenian Christians in Iran. So I have two questions. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you very much, James Berry, for invite, uh, accepting my invitation. My first question is about your book. Uh, we know that your book is one of the two books that includes discussions of Armenians, along with Elisa Sarian's book that was published in early 2000s. What is the main motivation and rationale behind publishing this book? Uh, and why do you think it is important for the researchers about this issue? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Begum, and thank you for inviting me. I think it's a great initiative. Um, I, I came to this topic mostly because I was interested in Armenians and also interested in Iran. So I, I melded the two together when I was a, a doctoral student at Monash University in Melbourne. Uh, in terms of Elis Sarian's book, that was one of the first books that I read when I was studying. And so uh, I was influenced greatly about it. I did read others, but because she was looking at contemporary politics in Iran, um, and I was also looking anthropologically at a contemporary community, uh, I was very much influenced by her framing. Now, she came from a, a, a larger study where she was looking at uh, minorities in Iran and the, the question of minorities in Iran, uh, ethnic and religious. And she honed in on religious minorities, particularly the, the recognized religious minorities of Armenian Christians, Assyrian Christians, Jewish, uh, the Jewish community and the Zoroastrian community that are recognized in the constitution uh, as, as the, the minority religions and therefore carry the term akaliyat or minority. Um, I, I started more narrowly and uh, more narrow. Uh, I started just with the Armenians. And then in the course of my research in, in Tehran in 2010, and also additional reading after I left the field, I, I spread out and looked more in comparatively at the other minority groups. Although uh, I, I focus more on Armenians, not so much on Azerbaijanis or Kurdish community or the Arab community or the Baloch, the other groups that I was interested in, but uh, was not uh, as expert in when I was, when I was doing this study. Um, so that's how it came to be. Elis Sanasariani is a, a great scholar and she's been a great influence and a mentor to me over the years. So um, she, uh, she has had a great influence, but I guess that what I've looked at, uh, what I've specifically looked at was what it was to be a Christian minority in an Islamic Republic. And I came in quite naively thinking that uh, if you're an Iranian citizen, you you see yourself as Iranian, not understanding uh, properly the politics of, uh, of identity in Iran. And, and very quickly, I learned from the Armenian community that, no, they saw themselves, the term Armenian or Armenian or Persian uh, as synonymous with being Christian. And because Iran was an Islamic Republic, they were not properly Iranian. They might be Iranian on, a, on their passport, but Iranians, or what they call Persians, Barsikner, and that includes people who speak languages other than Persian, like Azerbaijani speakers, they call them Persians, very often, not, not everyone, but colloquially, um, that they uh, they see them, uh, Muslim the Muslim uh, majority of Iran as the proper Iranians, and they are a foreign or um, a diaspora group that are present in Iran. So uh, that was a, a bit of a, I guess, a wake up call for me, but that's it also fed a lot of my research and understanding about nationalism, citizenship, and so forth, because to be, for many of the people I was interviewing and talking to in Iran, because they saw themselves as Armenian and not Iranian per se, did not mean that that meant they saw the Republic of Armenia, the former Soviet Republic of Armenia, as their home country. They definitely maintained a strong tie to it. But if uh, it came to politics, they wouldn't say, uh, you know, if, if in theory a war between Iran and Armenia happened, I would support Armenia. That's not what they meant. They more or less talked about themselves as a minority, like as many minorities do, 
as alienated from the majority and not, the country is defined by the majority so they're not fully belonging it was more or less uh, in in that sense and uh, i tried to make the study the, the book as it is uh expand in three ways both looking contributing to knowledge about armenians in iran and um for uh people who've studied armenians in iran sometimes they don't really like my book so much because my you tend to find literature on armenians in iran is more about the history and about the architecture and the uh, the contributions that iranian armenians have made politically uh, culturally to film and art and and um and the great figures of iranian armenian history whereas i've looked at more banal um people people who are mechanics who are accountants who are uh, regular members of the community and talk to them about uh, their their place in the world um rather than the, the bigger bigger picture the bigger figures um in terms of iranian studies i think the, the, what i've tried to do is talk about armenians in the context of the term minority which is usually restricted to the recognized religious minorities but increasingly over time uh it's starting to be accepted that certain linguistic groups are minorities like like the kurdish community like the baloch community also certain groups which were, which were classified as muslim but are technically minorities like the sunni muslim population and uh, and other groups similar groups is that so i've tried to to talk about it in that context when talking about iran and the way that ethnic identity in iran is very different to how it's taught in in european society in north american society in australia and other places so the way people think of ethnicity in iran is very different uh, and so i wanted to tease that out a little bit in my studies and finally just on looking at questions of nationalism and ethnicity i was trying to tap into debates between the ernst gellner anthony smith of uh, questions of how recent is nationalism how recent is ethnic identity uh, if we talk about armenians 500 years ago are we talking about people seeing themselves the same way as they do now i mean a lot of national identity and ethnic identity is built on continuity the idea that these are perennial identities that armenian people today are ancestors of armenian people 1000 years ago the same with uh, iranian people or 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 so forth um as well particularly with the, the the controversy around persian identity i mean iranian persian speakers don't call themselves persian or some of them do but it's a very awkward thing to, to call yourself a, an ethnic persian uh so i tried to communicate my research the ethnographic research into that context so essentially that's the rationale and the importance of it mm -hmm. yes thank you uh, it it's a very very uh, important book i think uh, my second question is in fact related with the, with some of the parts of your uh, answer uh, in your book uh, as part of a rich bibliography you you have made uh, several interviews and you uh, explore the armenian ethno religious identity uh, how it is established how it is constructed and uh, what kind of a relationship it has with the iranians so could you please let us know uh, more about the construction of armenian identity and how it is um, what kind of relationship it has with the Ar iranian identity mm -hmm. um well armenian identity throughout the armenian diaspora but also throughout uh in the republic of armenia and uh and former soviet countries has a uh, a lot of similarities and and the the shared similarities are three sort of cornerstones language religion and and the idea of a homeland um so it's interesting that the uh, the scouts the armenian scouts in iran actually as their slogan which david yakubyan uh, has written about in his book published a few years ago about scouts in iran or the history nationalism in iran with regard to armenians uh, that it's atsus azgis yevhayrani kis atsus means for my god azgis for my nation and uh, and hayrani kis for my homeland So it's explicit and it's a very ambiguous uh, he's David Yakubyan sort is ambiguous it could be the homeland could be Iran or it could be Armenia uh, and so forth but it's also explicit to many people who uh, are familiar with Armenian nationalism the national uh, ethnic national identity that Atsus is the Armenian Apostolic Church now not all Armenians are adherents to the Armenian Apostolic Church uh, including in Iran there are many Armenian Protestants and there are many Armenian Catholics there are many Armenians who um and not religious though because of the, poly, the 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 legal system in Iran to be uh, a, a, a citizen you have to be identified with a religion whether you practice it or not um the, the but it also tied into that in, in the Iranian context is the idea that you have to be a christian even if you're not a believing christian so a uh, an armenian who converts to islam which is more often than not happens when they intermarry with a, a muslim iranian 
um, is rejected from the community, more or less. And so that's how Christianity uh, as a discourse is tied to identity in Iran. And this is not just in Iran. This is throughout the Armenian world. Um, the second is language, the Armenian language, which, of course, is different than Persian. But it also affects the uh, Armenian identity in the fact that Iranian Armenians speak Armenian in a particular way. They have a particular series of dialects and a very recognizable accent, which is also present when some of them speak Persian. Uh, it, it's present in the way they pronounce certain letters, particularly letter R and the letter A. Um, so language is an important uh, uh, binding uh, element in terms of building community solidarity, but also excluding outsiders, because the only people who generally speak Armenian, at least in Iran, are other Armenians. You wouldn't expect uh, um, non-Armenians to speak it. I mean, there are exceptions, of course. You, you come across people of a Muslim background who come from areas, cities like Tabriz or Isfahan, where they've grown up with Armenians and they are familiar with Armenian, but still it's seen as like a boundary between them uh, and the rest of the community. Um, and the final part is homeland. So homeland is very ambiguous. There's this idea of historic Armenia, which people uh, talk of, Armenian people talk about, which includes parts of Eastern Turkey uh, and parts of uh, modern Armenia and uh, Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, there's also the Republic of Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh and part of Georgia, which is seen as Armenia as well, like uh, as a present homeland. Uh, and then there are those uh, historical um, events which are used to, to reinforce the idea of homeland and homeland lost. And uh, as you would be well aware, the biggest one is the commemoration of the Armenian genocide on the 24th of April, which is a big event in Iran for Armenians, uh, both as a protest and as a the community coming together as a mourning ceremony. And part of the, uh, the goal of that event is to bind Armenians in Iran together and with the Armenian community around the world as a cause because the majority of Iranian Armenians, unlike other parts of the diaspora, don't trace their origins to the Ottoman Empire before 1915. Most of the community in Iran have come uh, before that time and therefore don't have those connections. So it isn't a personal narrative like you see in other cities uh, in the around the world that connects them to, to April 24. It's, uh, it's the idea that it's a lost homeland. So uh, that's essentially uh, how the identity is construction, constructed. In terms of the Iranian identity, Iranian identity is actually technically very inclusive because it's almost a geographic identity which doesn't really discriminate between languages. So you can be a Turkish speaker, an Azerbaijani speaker, and be an Iranian because you're in Iran and you're from Iran. However, the way that the Islamic Republic de defines uh, national identity is exclusive. And it's more or less saying, you're not an Azerbaijani, you're not a Persian, you're a Muslim. Or if you're not a Muslim, you're not really an Iranian. If you're not a Shia Muslim, you're not really an Iranian. And then even further, if you're not a Shia, a Muslim, Shia Muslim who, is, who uh, adheres to the veliate fakti or the idea of the guardianship of the jurists, you don't belong. So that complicates things. And that also is a source of a lot of tension for a lot of communities in Iran, not just the Armenian community. But it does come back to a central, uh, central discourse that a lot of Armenians say, which I talk about in the book, which is to be a, an Iranian is to be a Muslim. And so since we're not Muslims, we can't really be Iranians. That's how uh, they talk about it. Um, but it is interesting, though, that Iranian identity is changing a lot. And Armenian relationships, Iranian-Armenian relationships with Iranian identity, especially in Tehran, are are changing as well. So there are younger generations who want to belong more, and there are those that want to be more contained as Armenians. But an important factor is, historically, they didn't necessarily want to go live in Armenia, especially after Armenia became independent. They saw it as, a well, economically, it's better to be in Iran, but also uh, they lived through the Iran-Iraq war, many of the uh, these, young, these Armenians who are now a little bit older, and their attitude was to live in a country like Armenia, which is in a constant state of war with Azerbaijan, it's not what they want to go through again. That said, they do visit Armenia a lot and they still consider Iran their home. And you do have this kind of retirement into Armenia where people retire and, and keep their pensions in Iran. Um, but they're sort of in both worlds in many ways. And when they move to Armenia, um, they often live in Iran in Armenian enclaves because they are culturally different. They're influenced by the Persian language and the Azeri, Azeri language. And this is reflected in how Armenians speak in Iran, the use of uh, Iranian-style methods of politeness, tarof, um, the um, 
for example, when they greet each other, when they say hello, or ask something of somebody else, they'll say, Hoknads Chilinek, which means, may you not be tired, which is a common polite thing okay. Persians say, Persian speakers say, they say, Khaste Nabulshi. So they have adopted a lot of that culture. Um, but so it's a very complicated situation. And, and that's really what I tried to tease out in my book by looking at both those forces that drew Armenians in and separate and made them feel more Armenian and those that were also drew them out and made them feel uh, a connection and a, a long, long-standing tie to Iran as a country, which is as much a mythical country as mythical in terms of a source of origin country as Armenia is. It's ambiguous in its borders. It's, uh, it has a long history that's tied to mythical figures uh, or historic figures that are so distant in the past, uh, we don't know if they existed or not. So uh, that, that's essentially what I was trying to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. In fact, we have some time. Um, I want to add my question, uh, something. Uh, uh, so you, your book is very um, uh, original because it has one of the two books, as I mentioned, noted in, in, in the beginning, it, along with uh, Elis Sanasarian's book published in 2000. So uh, what kind of uh, insights and original contributions can uh, scholars uh, get uh, learn from your book? Because you have made extensive interviews, so will they learn uh, the, what kind of things you know the Christian, uh, um, the Armenians uh, li uh, face in Iran? Are they happy in everyday life? The integration. So I can ask um, this. No, that's a good question. That's a very good question. Yeah. Um, uh, what I would say is there has been a lot of change from between when I when I did my research uh, and when Elis Sanasadian did her research in the early 90s, uh, there were major changes. Some of the things that she alluded to or predicted came to be, as in the Armenian community in Iran became more insular because they were defined as a religiously separate community. Um, but and I, and I talked about how there was a generational difference with a lot of younger Armenians uh, feeling more Armenian than their parents, who were definitely Armenian, but they also felt a connection to Iran. So I talked a bit about that. It's interesting for me, and also sometimes a little bit frightening, that over the past 10 years, there's been more change. Now, part of the reason is because much of the Armenian community has left since 1979, and in the past 10 years, more of the community is left. So the community is getting smaller and smaller. It used to be a very significant, um, uh, large Christian community that was well regarded in by many Iranians and had most Iranians had a positive view. But now they're becoming almost an unknown. Uh, they're becoming almost unknown because the community is getting so small. Um, but there's also changes that I didn't expect, which uh, is that ethnic sense of ethnic nationalism in Iran is becoming more pronounced uh, in amongst linguistic minorities, what I would call you know, linguistic minorities. So the Azerbaijani speakers, the Kurdish speakers have always had a strong sense of being quite different. Um, but this has become a problem that's been uh, showing up in the parliament, but also in parts of the country, which has led to ethnic tension. So you see tensions between Kurds and Azerbaijanis in Urumiye, which was uh, 10 years ago, not as pronounced. Uh, and uh, this is a really being caused by the inability of the Iranian or the Islamic Republic to to create a national identity or to be inclusive. It, it, by its nature, it's not. By its nature, it is you're either one of us or you're not. And um, this means that when there is, with corruption and everything else, neglect of peripheral areas like Iranian Azerbaijan, like Iranian Kurdistan, people know they're being disenfranchised by the government. And at a local level, they see it as being caused by ethnic uh, ethnic issues, that centralised Persians are disenfranchising marginal other ethnic groups. This is a discourse which in 2010 was not really a big thing. It wasn't a very serious issue. Now it's what I see constantly. And just to give you an example, um, the, the war that happened between Armenia and Azerbaijan last year saw probably the, the most anti-Armenian uh, slogans that I'd seen in protests in, in all the times that I've been watching Iran. Um, and part of the reason is because uh, Iran itself, public opinion is on the side of Azerbaijan and not Armenia. Even if politically uh, Iran is more aligned with Armenia, uh, it, it is the case that public opinion is more with Azerbaijan. 
uh, for a number of reasons. And it's not just because there are Azerbaijanis in Iran. It is because most Iranians, Religion. including Persian speakers, see Azerbaijan as historically part of Iran. Um, mm. But also it is a case that there is this, uh, I mean, to, to use a one of a better term, a growing sense, uh, a growing pan-Turkish movement on um, online, which is influencing people. Uh, and this is because the government is not really doing anything to, to, to add something to people's lives. So it's 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 almost like a a cycle of of dis, distance being formed, and I and I, and I worry for the future of the country uh, in that sense because, um, yeah, it, it, the fabric of the country could break up in, in much the same way we've seen in other, we've seen in other parts of the region. But hopefully it won't. But that's just something that concerns me. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much uh, uh, for the last five minutes. So, uh, um, if you want to add something. Um, about the scholars or the researchers focusing on these issues. Do you think that this is a challenging issue because in terms of history and politics, it, there are some tensions. What would you recommend to young scholars studying this issue? Um, that's a very good question. Now more than ever, it's hard to access Iran. Uh, when I was uh, a dissertation student, I had the advantage of coming from a country where no one, where Iranians didn't care about, or the Iranian government didn't care about Australia. Um, now Iran really uh, has a much more tight control and fear of outsiders than ever before. So outsider researchers doing research in Iran is much harder than it used to be. And that really uh, is inhibiting in terms of people who want to learn the language, want to learn Persian or other Iranian languages, or want to meet Iranian people in Iran and learn about Iran can't do it anymore. Even if what they're doing, what they're studying is not uh, something that would be offensive to the Iranian government in any way or problematic for the Iranian government, they're still, it's it's much more difficult. And, that, and that's sad to see. I'm, I'm hoping that it will change. But what I would say is that Iran is a very, very good place to do ethnographic research because there's so much um, to, to see. But also Iranians themselves are very uh, switched on about the situation in their country. They know a lot and they uh, they will tell you what you need to know and probably also, um, they, they won't tell you everything, of course, because of trust and, and whatnot, unless they know you well, but they're, they're very open sort of people and it's a very comfortable country to do research in. So I encourage people to study Iran, study the region as much as possible, but also to look at it comparatively. So when you look at Iran, don't look at Iran on its own, look at the neighbors as well. Learn about Turkey, learn about Iraq and learn about the Caucasus. Um, but overall, yeah, it's it, we're entering a little bit of a dark time, and it's not because just of the pandemic. It's uh, it's just the way the world is all over. It's not just that region. It's it's the region I live in as well. It's it's at many parts of the world, and that's it's sad to see. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, this opportunity. Thank Your you. book. Uh, Armenian Christians in Iran, uh, published by Cambridge University, uh, is a very, yeah, as I said, is a very important important book. And I want to thank you again for giving me this opportunity. Uh, thank you again. And I thank hope you for to the invitation. Thank you very much. I hope to see you maybe. Yeah, I hope to see you too. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Yeah, bye. One day soon. soon. Bye. Bye.